Today, we are talking with Tony Farinella, the owner and founder of Evidence Audio. Tony has some incredible experience when it comes to cable design, R&D, and has spent the last 25 years coming up with some incredible products that essentially make a difference on your pedal board. His music first approach means that his top priority is making you sound good. We are going to talk to him today about why cable capacitance does not matter and some other topics that are sure to be informative and really grow your knowledge in what it means to have quality cables on your pedal board. Post your questions below as I'm sure there'll be plenty and we'll make sure that Tony gets a chance to answer them and get back to you with all your difficult questions. Until then though, let's get into the interview and see what Tony has to say on the last 25 years of cable experience. So we are here with uh, Tony Farinella, I pronounced that right, mm -hmm. from Evidence Audio. And we are going to talk about basically, I guess, a history of what you have done and what your work has meant to the music industry as far as a very common component that us as musicians mm -hmm. take for granted. And we don't uh, often give it the care, the attention, uh, that it would uh, probably deserve. And that is essentially where, where you come in as one of the leading experts on essentially cable design, cable manufacturing, and how we hook our pedals together and how we connect racks and all this type of stuff. So mm. Tony, I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, uh, what, you're, what you've been up to during COVID and we'll just kind of go from there. Okay, sure. Well, um, yeah, COVID hasn't changed what I do much because what I do is kind of focused in small scale. I, I'm just a one man operation that relies on, you know, facilities to bring some of what happens up in here to life. You know, I don't, I don't go out to show up to an office with a bunch of people and mm -hmm. not have to shut any of that down. There's been some, you know, hiccups here and there with moving stuff around the world. Definitely, you know, sort of transportation related, but um, let me see if I want to get rid of a notification here. Um, uh, what I do stems from activities that kind of got focused when I finished university. I had always been interested, you know, through high school and young age with music and being involved with it. Trying to play was something I tried, but it never came naturally enough to me to where I spent more time listening to music and playing it back. So I spent time more with a sort of parallel interest in electronics and gizmos and doodads. I got really fascinated by uh, hi-fi equipment, you know, mm -hmm. like the dawn of CDs and turning these music into ones and zeros, which, you know, has, it was just, just fascinating. And, and I spent just sort of a layman study to, to pursue, you know, uh, how does this all work and how does it translate to experiences with me and my stereos and all the stuff I'd worked in the summer mowing lawns to, to purchase and uh, but in school I, I I realized I wanted to somehow work in the industry so to speak so what I decided to do was you know, draw a circle around my house within reasonable commuting distance you know like three counties with like a, within 100 mile radius who's making hi-fi equipment and there are a surprising number of places within my uh, sort of commuting distance. And there's this one that popped up as a specialty cable manufacturer. And so I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. Do cables matter? And I you know, decided, what do I have lying around here? And I don't know if I bought it or I just had it, but there was this kind of this monster cable pro link. It was a blue cable with silver barrels and gold ends. And I also had the sort of plastic ones you might get free with a CD player that had the red and uh, white, red for, right and white for left molded ends you'd plug in just a real, like we'll call that generic right and this monster cable clearly looked better i mean this was a hefty thing i might have paid 35 dollars for it right and i'm like well before i uh sent out my my cover letter and resumes to all these people i know one's going to go to that that cable company let me sit down and listen to the monster cable and the generic i go back and forth between the two back and forth back and forth 
and it was this particular Harry Connick song. I don't even know the name of it, but I, I think it's called Drifting. But anyway, there's a particular breathy part of his vocals where you, know, you could hear him breathe between lines. And, and when I was single-mindedly focused on his vocals, I went back and forth. I could hear it. Yeah, it was there. It was consistent. It was repeatable. I, I had convinced myself enough that there was a difference between these two cables. And I wasn't sure which was better, but I said to myself, ah, there's something going on here. And we're talking buffered line level CD output and hearing it through these speakers and then up to where I would have someone in and switch between the two mm -hmm. and make a note on what they did. And I would make notes here, you know, and I would go, all right, let's compare, you know, line up, boom, 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 boom. But 10 trials, I got them all right. So um, quickly ordered up some of this cable manufacturer stuff. When that stuff arrived, there was a pair of uh, interconnects and I go, well, here's the test. Here's this high-end stuff that gets all these reviews and these high-end magazines, right? Where the attention is, you know, I was listening, Monster Cable is sort of like the bows of speaker cable, right? It's out there. People appreciate it and they spend money on it. There's value added. A lot of it may be perceived value, uh, but here's the stuff that's supposed to be the good stuff, right? And then I remember there was that would be an aha moment where I would go back and forth between this sort of Monster Cable and the generic stuff, which... You know, if you cut them off the plugs and look on the inside, they are kind of similar, more similar than different. But here I brought in this third cable that was using very different materials and, and approach and geometry and design. And when I connected that, it was just like we were going back here. This A, B, A, B, A, B, C. I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is this is like something. This is right. Like, all right. So like that was a really cool moment, I guess, that got me excited. I went to work for them anyway. I spent six years and, and, and really got to learn all aspects of R&D and spending, you know, spending all my time in the sound room, learning all about their, their products and um, other people's products, how to evolve our products, bringing in uh, additional materials, considering different designs, um, you know, just spending half of my day in a, in a sound room, listening and comparing all these variables and the other half of the day doing sort of logistics. And so there came a point in time where it's just like, okay, I've kind of learned a lot here, but the fact is it wasn't people making music, right? It wasn't people playing guitar. It wasn't people connecting a microphone to a cable, like Harry Connick Jr. And I was listening to that. I'm like, what if he had used this cable connected to the microphone when he was recording it? I want to take what I know to the guys on the other side that are recording, producing, mixing, mastering, playing music. And um, that's what I did. I mean, found, founded Evidence Audio. That's amazing. And just quickly, when what year was Evidence Audio founded? Ooh. I think 1997 is sort of the, uh, the date, you know, I, I believe I founded it. And that might be the time I built my first product. I would make an occasional sale with a website. Like, and if once a week or once every two weeks, I got an email saying, oh, this customer just bought a cable for you. It was like, oh, wow. And, you know, it was great. And I would send it to them. They would have that same aha moment that I had mm -hmm. when I first got that stuff that was built differently. Why don't I spend some time trying selling what's in there? So just fire off some emails or faxes, try to introduce myself and mm -hmm. send my value proposition. Like, hey, I think your, your customers would really appreciate it. And it was a way to sort of knock down doors without ever leaving the house and, you know. Yep. Getting out there early really helped in that way. It's still just like a low key passion project that I'm grateful I can do full time. Mm. You know, but yeah. I love hearing that. I love hearing the backstory that we wouldn't normally see from a, a shopping cart, you know, buy this product yeah. or if we're on one of your distributor sites like Evidence Audio and we hear about the product, but I think it's great to hear about the history. Uh, and how we got to this point to where we're chatting today. Can you, can you just talk quickly to just highlight some of that experience that you had and how you developed your ear to hear those differences uh, uh, with, with okay. now what you're applying to Evidence Audio and creating product? Well, I guess it was always like a philosophy that said, be open-minded, but be skeptical, be cynical, have a healthy cynicism because there's so much involved with sort of psychoacoustics or hearing things we want to believe things that are designed by ear 
but when you design by ear, you have to be realistic and a little skeptical, a little cynical. The, the, sort of the goal was to, to develop a product that got out of the way of the music. Let's not try and make it sound one way or another. Let's try and get out of the way of the music. The founding philosophy was that ca all cables are bad and they're not going to improve your sound. They're only going to cause less damage to it. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a baseline of, okay, here's, here's my, my audio signal going in and here's my audio signal coming out. The cable's not going to make it come out any better. Mm -hmm. All cables are going to make it come out a little bit worse. Some really worse. So like I'd spend my, my job was to send and listen to things, variables that would keep, that would bring it as close to here as possible. Right, to just get it up, recognizing I'm never going to do this, I'm never going to do this, but how do we keep it from doing damage? And, you know, you, that's when you just spend time listening to you know, what, what variables are there, conductor material, copper versus silver. And then, you know, when you, if you can isolate variables like one copper versus another, if it's refined to the nth degree, I would spend time trying to establish what's the difference that I can hear. And, and maybe it's uh, taking 20 gauge conductors build a set of cables. All right, we're just gonna dwell in the difference in that material and go back and forth. So that could be a morning session like for a couple hours. But if you can consistently repeated, repeatedly con convince yourself that, yeah, I'm hearing there's something there, then it's like, okay, that's when you call in the colleagues. Hey, you know, yeah, there's something here. All right, well, maybe that's something I pull into the product development process. All right, so we've isolated whether or not this, this particular material is is it does less harm to the signal and allows more music through, right? Getting back to the whole purpose, the philosophy is to, to not impart a sound or make it sound one way or another, hopefully just be friendly and serve the music. If it, does it hurt the music in a way like a silver, silver plated copper conductor does? It's got that sort of ice pick mm -hmm. effect where you just don't want to listen. You just want to walk away. You're not going to play as long or listen as long you realize that what's there is additive and some things you just, you know, you don't want to use that, use them just as a gimmick effect because you really want to serve the music. You want to bring design compromises, considerations, techniques, materials into your product that want you to listen and play more that don't have you put the guitar down because, ah, it sounds exciting and zing, woo. But then eh, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is the R and D sort of came from products that served the music and and didn't have the expectation of trying to make it better, but with cables just don't make it any worse. Mm -hmm. And 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 spend time just like going back and forth between whatever variable there are. And there are many. There's so many to list, you know. Sit down and listen. Find out. That's what I did for years. It was yeah. just sit down and listen and find out. But also trying to be honest and and recognize that you know, we have a way of sometimes fooling ourselves when, when we listen to these things, you know. So, so again, make it re repeatable, demonstrable to others. And if you kind of get a consensus that, you know, we're not fooling ourselves, all right, if it's better, let's bring it to market. You've done an unbelievable amount of uh, tests for R&D. So if we were in a perfect world scenario, mm -hmm. what would the perfect cable actually look like? I've read a little bit of your material and you've, you've said something about copper hanging in the air essentially without any insulation can be the perfect cable. And I would love to hear more about that and then how you try and get close to that cable that gets, like you said, out of the way of the music. Okay. That they you know the real world in a perfect world, the perfect world is where everything sounds great and you don't care about these, these compromises. Like, so you, you're in a you know you're in an environment that doesn't have any noise or RF, so oh you can get rid of shielding. We don't need shielding. Now I'm just taking these bare copper or silver solder between two connectors, and carefully positioning between the DAC and an amplifier. And when you switch to that, you're just like, oh my, Lord. it's just it's unbelievable. It's bliss. It's like you just realize how you've been listening to these cables that are compromised, have all this stuff in there getting in the way. And then now here you have this incredible sound because you're only listening to just these bare conductors, you know? And, and so that's always, that's always a little reminder about how, you know, how but, but hey, that's the perfect world, right? Like where yep. no one's gonna practically put that between their guitar and their amplifier, two pieces of metal suspended in air. 
I mean, I think back to the best interconnects I ever heard. It was this Kogan Hall cable and he figured it out and he made something that was totally impractical. In the perfect sound world, it was, a, it was the best cable I ever heard, but it was this extruded copper tubes and they were small thin walls. So there was no skin effect that come creeping into play. There was no strand interaction. Uh, but it was like copper piping that you find to carry water throughout your home. Mm-hmm. But it was miniaturized. It was down to where the to the tubes were the size of the phone, the center pin of a phone connector, RCA phone, RCA plug. And and they were he separated positive and negative by these nylon spacers, and they were like they almost like railroad tracks. And there was no insulation, no shielding. It was just copper tubes that literally plugged into one one jack and plugged into the other nothing else and you know listening to that, it was just it was glorious you, all you heard was music i mean and then everything else by comparison was doing something to the music you know that was the least practical product ever you know it just you couldn't bend it you would have to like put your components back to back so you could it was just so kind of it was funny and ridiculous but it was amazing and beautiful and inspiring at the same time you know so then you have to figure out like how can i accomplish something close to that but it's going to work in the real world. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. going to take something on stage, you know, like, yeah, shielding compromises the sound. Um, and if you don't have any noise in your environment, take the shield off. Yeah, go nuts. Enjoy the, the added benefit. You know, the open, the higher frequencies are more open and extended. You don't sound closed down as much. You can hear it spatially. But, you know, take that cable out into the real world and it's suddenly unusable. You know, so it's like, what are you going to do? You got to, you got to, if you want to have a product that works in the marketplace, you got to make sure that it you know, will work 98, 99% of the time. But what are some things as a beginner that we can listen out for when we're going back and forth? You've, you've mentioned about sure. the high frequencies, maybe they're actually more distorted, but like what are some practical things we can do to yeah. start making up our mind? For me, the, some of the things that sound is like baselines, all right? Because I find that differences in cables, when the cables are designed differently, there can be a pretty significant uh, effect on the bottom end. Now, what do you mean by that? Like transient response, okay? Like bass notes tend to hit, boom, and then there's a wave. Mm-hmm. And then there can be harmonic distortions or harmonics of that that are real and exist in the first place or are there and also exaggerated. And that, those can be exaggerated with, with distortions caused by strand interaction. Uh, geometry and and so like it can sort of extend it or bloom it or make it sound bigger and thicker to the extent it could be a bit muddy but other cables will hit boom and just decay that like you could feel it like you, i can sit next to someone that's demoing cables and the play the play the, but particularly on the bass like when it hits with a solid core conductor it hits and i can feel it in my, my the pant legs like next to the cab movement, or I can feel it in the seat, I can feel it in my feet through the floor and it's gone. And um, it's just fast and it's, it's articulate. Where if I switch to a different cable with a different design, it might, you know, I might hear it more in my ear. I don't feel it as much, mm-hmm. right? So it's like kind of shifts up out of the physical impact transient realm and more into the thicker, fatter, realm and i think to myself all right that's wrong in my opinion right so what i'm trying to do is get away from that and i, I generally gravitate with my preferences towards something that fat, because fast and, and articulate because to me that is uh, that's just the note that's just the music and without anything else added to it mm-hmm. and if you want to have hear more bass there are other ways to compensate for that or get there you can move a cabinet closer to uh a wall, you know, standing waves. Where are you in the room? Um, you know, tone controls. Like, use these things. Let's bring in things you want to the signal, but not have it be done by the cable because you can't take the cable out. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't want a cable that's adding anything, and I want something that's neutral. It's going to work with a variety of systems. If people want to add pedals or control or EQ, go ahead, but don't have to change a cable every time you you do like that's one of the first things i listen for another thing is like mid-range and focus uh guitar note separation chord chords are great you know if you just play some clean chords to me i like to listen like 
do I hear a chord is just a, a mash of everything together, making a sound. It could be beautiful, wonderful. That's great. But, or when you switch to another cable, sometimes when you play that same chord, is it easier to hear the individual notes that make up the chord? So it's like, are you, are you looking at the forest or are you looking at the forest and seeing the trees at the same time? Mm -hmm. All of these individual notes that, and it's just a richer experience to me. And I think that that's it. That's the second thing. It's pretty easy to hear in uh, cable differences to stand out. So we kind of cover like, you know, the, the, the trifecta that what, what, what happens in the bottom and the mid range and, and in the high end, I just want to make sure if I listen to a product, does it, does it hit me? Does it irritate in the high end? You know, like, is it, is it, is it bright? Is it, is it irritating or is it just smooth and open? I mean, I don't want it to be rolled off or dark or syrupy. I want to have extended high frequency information, all of it there. But if I ever hear something that well, it's excite my inner ear too, but anytime you excite the inner ear sooner rather than later with a product, I'll take the product that excites the inner ear later. That's just something I'll listen for. That's a little more harder to hear like in certain circumstances. But I think the most in your face stuff would be that baseline articulation and transient response. And then, like I said, second later, note definition in the mid range. Um, you know, I love when people make a decision based on personal experience. They sort of go through the process. One of the best ways to do it is to just to make a 10 foot cable or a longer cable of a particular model, pedal board cable A and pedal board cable B. Mm -hmm. And try it out on the guitar. Get between two pedals, turn up the volume, and you don't have to redo your entire pedal board. Just take one pedal patch cable in that signal path and go back and forth mm -hmm. between two cables that you're considering and hear what the difference is. Does one do one thing or another? Like it's, does one clean up the bass a little bit? Does one seem to thicken it up and slow it down? Does the mid range seem to uh, lose some articulation if you're playing clean, you know? Like, and you can learn in just one position in a pedal board or out of the guitar to the pedal board or from the pedal board to an amplifier. There you go. And just listen between the pedal board and the amplifier, what one cable does if you're going between model A and model B. And then when you can establish reliably what are, where your preference is and go, yeah, I, I have a consistent preference for this cable. Now you can redo your pedal, whole pedal board with that cable. Mm -hmm. and expect the same results and you know you just extend it you know i'd like to think that one cable is causing less damage to the signal to the other and you're hearing it between the pedal board and the amplifier now take every single cable within your pedal board and prevent that damage from happening there you've got 10 opportunities or 20 opportunities to prevent that damage from happening that you heard just between the pedal board and the amplifier you know so it's like this cumulative degradation that takes place mm -hmm. You know, with these cables and uh, it can add up. What you've said in um, previous articles that I've read, which is a really cool analogy that uh, describes what you're saying with the, the concept being that every cable will do something to your signal. Uh, the idea being probably more negative. You have this analogy of looking through, let's say there's 20 cables on your board, looking through 20 panes of glass and each pane of glass is going to slightly distort the image on the other side. And so what you're right. essentially saying, if I'm understanding correctly, is make sure you're using the best panes of glass or the best cable for every connection that you need to make to get the best possible final image. It won't be perfect, but the best yeah. final image you can get between start and finish. Would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it, it's simultaneously, it's a visual analogy for what cables are doing to the signal. They're coloring it or taking things out of focus because the panes of glass aren't you know, ideal. You know, and they're all adding some degradation to the signal. You know, as you look through them all, mm -hmm. what you're seeing is colored or filtered by the, the summation of the damage caused by all, caused by all these individually. And <clears throat> so you'd like them all to be clean so that what you're looking at or what you're listening to is more representative of where none of this in the signal path, right? You're yeah. plugging straight into the guitar. What I hear is like looking straight at a beautiful sunset, but you add a pedal, you add a cable, you add this, you know, so all these 20 cables that sit there between you and what you're looking at are gonna distort things some, 
So we want to have them all be as clean as possible. Mm -hmm. And it simultaneously addresses the weakest link theory that a lot of people subscribe to. And I try and dispel where they'll say, you know, do I have to change all my pedal cables or I have one bad cable in there. And so why should I bother changing any of these cables? My signal is only going to be good as the, the worst cable in there. And I try and say, no, it doesn't work like that because if you're looking through 20 panes of glass and you were to take one of these out, clean it, get the Windex out, polish it as best you can, slide it back in. I mean, guess what? You're gonna, you're, the view's gonna be better. Mm -hmm. Whatever damage was being imparted by that particular pane of glass is no longer adding to the cumulative degradation of your view. And in the same token, that cable on your pedal board is no longer degrading the signal as much as it was before. So yeah, they work independently. Yeah. yeah. So which is really a weak link. Which is uh, fascinating. And again, something that I've learned from you and reading these articles, I realized, I guess, kind of without fully doing this consciously, that one of my biggest priorities became good shielding for noise rejection. But from reading what you have said, there is also a flip side to that coin of having a really good shield around your cable will also then have an effect on the tone that that cable produces. And so can you talk to the balance between great shielding and noise rejection and tone? Sure. And I almost feel bad bringing up this impractical reality that says, oh, you know, shielding's bad. Well, what am I supposed to do? Don't shield it? Yeah, don't shield it. And then as soon as you step into an environment where you need it, what are, you gonna, what are I going to do? I shield my cable. You got to have a cable that's going to work for you in a variety of situations and it's gonna have shielding. That's not something you can practically change. Like, oh, I'm gonna dial the shield switch, dial it more shielding and less <laughs> shielding. I mean, I shield my cables, I shield them well. I don't shield them as, so, but I don't, as to your point, I don't, I consciously don't shield them so much or too much, or there are ways to go about shielding. You could, and then people will sell their cable on that uh, basis, like, you know, triple mm -hmm. shielded, whatnot. But you hear it, you know, things close down and, it's just not as musical as a cable that might just have enough shielding for the particular situation. I get a question, are your cables well shielded? I, shielding is important to me, just like they were for you. It's a concern, it's a, it's a priority. And I, I'll say, yeah, it's, they are well shielded. I think you'll be fine under many cases. I've never really had a complaint because I shield them enough for most circumstances. You, do the, you, you just do, do balance these trade-offs. No, that's great. And I think, like, as you're saying, for the vast majority of people, your cables are going to be an eye-opening experience for them because of this attention to R&D and detail that you put in. Yeah. And what type of musicians are the most loyal to Evidence Audio? Like, which ones just keep coming back and mm. love your product? Good question. I do find uh, almost all of them are quite loyal. And it doesn't mean uh, I think I, I, it's interesting. Customers do come back. It's almost like once they try it, they're just like, oh, I really don't want to use anything else. I don't, think, I don't say all oh, my customers are loyal because they have that aha moment mm -hmm. and they change one cable and then they realize, eh, and they come back to do this. You know, as their time and budget and attention allows, my customers are the type of customers that tend to like do everything and eventually start wiring the pickup cavity with my hookup wire or replacing captive spear cables inside the cabinets. This is sort of how it just proliferates, pr proliferates through their system uh, because they really have an appreciation for that aha moment and they know that the quality is kind of a one-way street and they don't want to go back. They become loyal to that sound, I guess, or that lack of sound or that quality. They, they tend to really dig it a lot. So those are maybe that just have spent time and attention focusing, hearing, experiencing and going wow this is this is the stuff i want and then they, when they tell me that i'm like oh wow thank you you know that's really cool but they're they're, uh, they're having fun you know because mm -hmm. yeah these are sort of who my customers are like these this group of uh, enthusiasts that are so passionate about what they do not only do they love it what it does for them they, they have fun sharing that with others and that, that's really cool one of the one of the things i guess that i absolutely love is essentially if you look at in your in your rig from guitar to amp and everything in between if you look at everything that is always used 
So your guitar mm -hmm. is always used. Your guitar's instrument cable is always used. Your delay pedal is not always used, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, but basically take all of the things, write a list of all those things that are always going to be used. And those are probably the first things you should start looking at when wanting to make changes with your board. Instead of what I, I feel like the, the culture has kind of become is when I have a tonal issue, I'm just gonna buy a new pedal. And that, that pedal will fix my, my tonal issues. So I think, uh, you know, with Evidence Audio, the reason we're chatting is because your biggest priorities are not necessarily how do I sell as many of these cables and make as much money as I possibly can. It's how do I actually create something that will make a difference and inspire you to keep creating music. And I just think it's um, a brilliant way to go about running a business for someone that has never thought about their cables before. Maybe a first step is to just buy an evidence audio cable and just start doing some uh, some listening at home. So like meditate on the sounds you're hearing, as you said, go back and forth, do some A-B testing, and if possible, get someone else to do it so you don't know which cable is being used yeah. and uh, and see what you hear. And maybe that's a good next step for people. Would, uh, would that be fair to say? Change one variable at a time. You know, just one patch cable and just go through it see whether or not you hear it is it repeatable just like everything i did going into the cable convince myself am i convinced time to, to convince myself i'm hearing something is what i'm hearing you know is it meaningful repeatable can can someone else hear it as well and then uh, you know then you know well gee is it worth that extra money or is it, maybe it's less money from what you were using but before you do the, the overhaul investment in the entire board that's a great way to sort of give yourself some confidence checking out what happens in one particular position gives you an idea and it helps you set a healthy expectation. Mm -hmm. And then, then, you know, like in that one case with that one cable, did I meet, exceed, or did it not live up to my expectations? If it didn't live up to your expectations, keep what you have. Or if it exceeds your expectations, hey, you know, get excited and yeah. look forward to, to doing the whole board because, you know, it's a slam dunk and you'll have confidence that you're not Wasting time and money on projects. You know. I think that's great. It does. It does lead into one other question. I'm not sure if you're going to like this question or not, but uh, it's basically around people that I've chatted to in the past. They have done, uh, you know, a smaller rig with all evidence audio from maybe George Els, and they've said, "No, I like my George Els better." What mm -hmm. What's going on there? What What would you say to those people? And and can you speak to what they they might be experiencing and what they're hearing? comfort preference we can get very comfortable to a particular sound or reaction if we make a change be it better or worse just the change is, is is uncomfortable and we like to go back to what we were using and if a system is kind of voiced in a particular way based upon the driver they're using the age of the driver uh, the amp age of the tubes in the amp it could be with a, a set of George L's in that, in that infrastructure offers a balance to where it adds something that the system was kind of muting, taking out, rolling off in other, other places to where it just provides a nice little bit of a harmony. And when they play, they hear what they're comfortable with and it's balanced to them and it's them. It's who they are and they don't, they don't want to change that. Put in something like an evidence audio, and then all of a sudden, you're starting to hear more of those other things, and it just comes out of balance for them. I think, um, I guess one of the things that comes to mind as I'm hearing you chat is, or answer that question, is I remember talking to an audio engineer about uh, mixing. And he, he was talking to the context of, he was listening to these younger guys mixing uh, the specific example was kick drums and the kick drums weren't sounding like kick drums. They were sounding like something that was uh, poorly interpreted. And so he asked these guys, have you ever gone up uh, in, uh, safely, but have you ever put your ear right in front of a kick drum and just listen to what a kick drum actually sounds like? And obviously the answer was no, they haven't. They were interpreting what they thought a kick drum should sound like. And all of this to say, it seems like, uh, and this would be my experience, that oftentimes when you use cables or, and not just cables, certain pieces of gear, 
you get this interpretation of what a guitar should sound like. But yeah. when you use something like an evidence audio or something in a perfect world with no shielding and all that, and you listen to what a guitar can and does sound like with, with much less in the way, then now you have a, a more realistic idea of, okay, this is now my starting point. This is, a, yeah, this is the base sure. from where we now build our sound on rather than getting interpretations that might not actually be uh, real. Maybe I actually don't know what my guitar should really sound like and I need to do some investigating. Oh, let's yeah. figure out what our instrument sounds like in its best possible form and then start adding in layers after that. There is one last question I want to finish with, which is going to uh, stir the pot a bit, which is why I want to ask it. In the industry, capacitance is what you judge a cable on. The lower the capacitance, the better your, your rig is going to sound. From what I've gathered, that is not something that you would necessarily agree to. Can you give us some reasons why capacitance isn't the be all and end all in your opinion? and what we really should be paying attention to. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's a handle that people grab onto. When we make, the cables are mysterious. Most of them you listen to, they all sound the same or the marginal differences. Very rarely do you come across someone who's building something outside the box. It's a thing that a customer can grab onto and say like, oh, this is 32 picofarads a foot. All right, I understand now this cable is 45 picofarads a foot. That's got to be the explanation for the differences because we understand capacitance. What does it do? It shifts the resonant peak in an RLC circuit on a, between a guitar and a pedal board or whatnot. Um, we know can that I, in long runs. Can yeah. I stop you right there? Because you just, you brush over something that I think a lot of us can be lost by. Can you translate what you just said about capacitance and an RLC circuit into uh, what that might translate into audio terms? Like okay. uh, simplify it for sure, us? Sure, sure. For, to, I guess to be simple, you know, between the pickups and the input stage, you know, there's going to be a relationship where the cable going between those two is going to have a certain capacitance value. That circuit between the, the pickups and the input stage is going to have sort of like a resonant peak and, and frequency, like literally you can measure it, you can hear it, like at, in the mid range, it's going to have a little bump. And then if you change to a cable that has a different capacitance value, you're going to shift that peak up or down. So that peak is going to, instead of being in the mid range, be a little lower, a little higher, mm -hmm. right? I'm not talking from bass, mid or treble, but it's going to shift a little bit. And people like to, to say like, I like this cable better than that cable. So they say, well, all you're hearing is a shift in that peak. And if you like this cable or this cable, it's just because it's shifting that resonant peak, okay? It, 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 and it, it's a comfortable way for people to say like, all right, what do I like? Oh, I like the peak here. What cable am I using? <clears throat> well, I'm using brand X model Y in 10 feet or 20 feet. That's the capacitance in this situation. They go down that rabbit hole and realize, oh, I'm dealing with a 732 picofarad cable. I like 732 picofarad cable. <laughs> You know, and if someone's trying to say low capacitance is better, why? Oh, well, well, I've got a cable here that's 532 peak for it's plug it in. It's going to be better. Like, and they can plug it in and it's going to shift that peak. They might like it more. They might like it less. It depends on what, if they change guitars or they change what they're plugging it into. What, why, do, why do people think low capacitance is better? Well, there's this other thing that comes into play outside of the RLC circuit, where it's just the traditional brick wall filtering effects of capacitance, where over X number of meters, uh, capacitance value is going to have a high frequency roll off. Mm -hmm. No doubt, there's the mass there and you can hear it. With the narrow band width of a, of a guitar, in the context of 20 to 100 feet on a pedal board, the idea that a 32 picofarad foot cable is necessary or even better than a 48 picofarad. It doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. But it's this handle that people cling to because it's sort of, it's, it's logic based and it just sort of, sort of just, you know, it makes sense. And so, so you get customers that are trying to make an informed, you know, understandably educated 
decision based on logic and reason that low capacitance is better than high capacitance. So I'm going to go around and shop for the best low capacitance scale I could find. And then the all flip side of that coin is you got manufacturers that realize that customers' motivations are, you know, to look for a low capacitance cable. I'm going to sign a low capacitance cable and I'm going to sell mine on the basis that it's lower than the competitor. So someone comes out and says, oh, what's that? Okay, that's 32 picofarads a foot. Oh, you should try this one. It's 24. Oh, well, but this one's... So, so you get this like, sort of arms race of ignorance on the selling side and the consumption side where they're just going down this rabbit hole. It doesn't even matter. you know. And it bothers me a lot in a way that when sometimes people get sent me an email, hey, what's the capacitance of your reveal cable? And then I, I have a sort of cut and paste diet <laughs> that I send. I, you know, I have my little opinions that a lot of people, they don't, I don't understand or they take issue with. But um, I always like down at the end, I'm like, all right, if you've read this far and you still want to know the capacitance of my cable, just reply and I'll tell you. So like, it's not a secret, the capacitance of my cables. I don't publish it. I really don't talk about it. If someone raises the issue, I go on a rant, rant, rant to try and educate my you know, position on the matter. Uh, and if they're going to get the capacitance number out of me, I'm going to make them work for it. You know, just a little <laughs> bit. So like, I'll tell you, but first I'm going to like yeah. get up on my hill and tell you why it doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. Or, you know, if so, if, if you're choosing a cable, if you're asking and you're trying to decide based on, you're buying a cable for all the wrong reasons. But I totally understand why they ask because yeah. Uh, so capacitance is not the the measurement for cable quality. To drastically simplify what you said, what would be if someone is online <laughs> trying to make an educated decision? Is there are there some numbers that they should pay attention to, or is it more of the approach of let's research what this company's philosophy is on on cable and then pick a few that resonates for lack of a, for a bit of a pun, and then actually do some audio examples and just let your ears decide. Am, am I oversimplifying? Yeah, that's great, Grant. No, that, that's perfect. You know, you're faced as a consumer today with a hundred different options out there. And if you don't have the energy, the best thing you can do is just find someone you trust who has good sound and say, tell me what to do. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. But if you are curious, you know, if you're going to pick three cables out of a hundred, are you going to look at the numbers and the specs? Or, no, I, I wouldn't. If you can find some way to like find three cables that are just designed different, like one one is solid, one stranded, one uses a uh, twin axe design, floats a shield one. So at least you're not wasting your time. You're listening to variables that are have a large magnitude of difference because you could you could just pick three cables from three brands. And you know what? They're so close on the inside that you can spend a lot of focused attention just noticing a little bit of a difference. Maybe not a preference, but if you were to get three things that were designed like with radically different approaches, maybe something will push your buttons. You know, you're more likely to have an experience between the three that has a bigger magnitude of a difference, an experience where you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really cool. I love that. I connect with that. That pushes my buttons. Or, you know, oh, that's irritating i don't like that at all it's different but it's not for me and then you know i guess you're more likely to evolve your system in a direction that is worthwhile and, and, and mm -hmm. makes you enjoy your music from my point of view that is really what i wanted to cover today and you know we've talked about some of the questions i had in mind and much more and i, I appreciate your time and, and taking the uh the space out to educate us on what you've been up to what you do with evidence audio uh, why you are so passionate about cables and ultimately creating great music and helping other people do the same so thank you for your attention to detail thank you for the interview today and, um, you know, we'll, we'll put this up for people to post. And if anyone asks some great questions, I might forward them to you. And so you can chime sure. in on YouTube or, or whatever it might be. But, uh, but yes, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Grant. And um, any, any final closing remarks? I don't want to just cut you off there. but Just a note I uh, used to put on the back of my packaging for anybody who did buy one of my products. That in the end, this last closing line after explaining all the stuff they might listen for and why. It just says, uh, have fun and keep the music first. Yeah.
That's it. I hope that interview was helpful and that you learned a lot about what it means to wire up your rig with quality cable. It does make a difference and now you have a few tools to know what to look out for in future. Try out some of Tony's cables. They are now available on the Goodwood Audio website for patch cables. Do some comparisons and see what you come up with. I hope that's been helpful. Post your questions below and we'll see you next week for another video on the Goodwood Audio YouTube channel.